In the female embryo, internal genital organs develop from two Mullerian ducts, first identified at about six weeks gestation. The Mullerian ducts will elongate caudally and cross medially to meet in the midline behind the colloquium. By seven week gestation, the urorectal septum develops and separates the colloquium into two parts. The posterior part forms the rectum, while the anterior part forms the urogenital sinus. Here is an anterior view of the Mullerian ducts approaching the urogenital sinus. By 12 week, the caudal portion of the Mullerian ducts fused to form the uterovaginal canal. By 20 weeks, the septum between the two Mullerian ducts is reabsorbed, forming a single cavity. The fused part of Mullerian ducts will form the uterus, cervix, and the upper vagina, while the unfused portion will develop into the fimbria and the fallopian tubes. Regarding the formation of the lower part of the vagina, the uterovaginal canal, which insert into the dorsal wall of the urogenital sinus, at molar tubercle, will stimulate two solid outgrowths, known as sinovaginal bulb. The sinovaginal bulbs proliferate, forming a solid vaginal plate. The central cells of this vaginal plate will degenerate, forming a cavity. The canal will later open kephalad to communicate with the upper vagina and open caudal to communicate with the urogenital sinus. And finally, it ends with the formation of fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, and vagina. The upper part of the vagina originate from the Mullerian duct, while the lower part of the vagina originate from the urogenital sinus. In conclusion, Mullerian structures form through three steps. These are organogenesis, which is the development of Mullerian ducts, followed by fusion of the caudal part of the duct, followed by resorption of the septum in between the ducts to form a single cavity. Regarding organogenesis problem, failure in formation of post Mullerian ducts results in uterine agenesis or hypoplasia. In its complete form, it's known as Mullerian agenesis or Meyer Rokitansky Kosterhauser shortly known as MRKH. Failure in formation of one Mullerian duct results in unicornate uterus, while hypoplasia of one duct will result in a unicornate uterus and a rudimentary horn. The rudimentary horn may be functioning or non-functioning. The functioning rudimentary horn may be non-communicating or communicating. Partial failure infusion results in bicornuate uterus, which may be complete or partial, while complete failure infusion results in didelphys uterus. Didelphys means twins, where two uterine cavities, two cervical canals, and two vaginal canals are formed. Overa is a variant of uterine didelphys. Normally, Mullerian duct fuse together and open in the urogenital sinus. Two kidneys develop beside Mullerian ducts. In overa, one kidney is absent. The Mullerian duct on the same side is displaced laterally and cannot be used with the contralateral duct. This will result in didelphys uterus. It also doesn't open in the urogenital sinus, leading to an obstructed hemivagina. The triad of didelphys obstructed hemivagina and epsilateral renal agenesis is known as ovira. Failure of resorption results in aseptate uterus. Now let's describe few informations about every abnormality. Congenital absence of both uterus and vagina is termed Mullerian agenesis or meyer rokitansky kosterhauser in its classic form, the patient has a shallow vaginal pouch. While the uterus, cervix, and the upper part of the vagina are absent, 
However, normal ovaries are present. The patient present with primary amenorrhea. And because ovaries are present, secondary sexual characteristics and hormonal profile are normal. Karyotyping also is normal. However, ultrasound will reveal absent uterus, normal ovaries, and don't forget to look for renal anomalies because they are present in 15 to 35 percent of women with Mullerian agenesis. Management options include creation of a functioning vagina, typically performed with vaginal dilators. Repeated coitus is also effective, and surgical management options are also available. Regarding fertility management, gestational surrogacy, I mean oocyte retrieval, fertilization, followed by embryo transfer into the uterus of a surrogate mother, is an option. Uterine transplantation is another option. Simple unicornuate uterus may be an incidental finding during the infertility workup. Non-communicating heart will result in a cyclic abdominal pain due to accumulation of blood in the heart. Ectopic pregnancy inside rudimentary heart may present with a life-threatening intraperitoneal hemorrhage due to ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Hysterosalpingography usually demonstrates a single laterally deviated uterine canal, or it may reveal a two asymmetrical canals. However, non-communicating heart is missed with hysterosalpingography. 3D ultrasound and MRI add more information. And again, renal sonography is important because 40% of women have some degree of renal agenesis usually epsilateral to the anomalous site. Regarding management, no surgeries are currently available to elongate the unicornuate uterine cavity. Excision of a cavitary rudimentary horn is indicated because of the high maternal mortality and morbidity, secondary to intraperitoneal hemorrhage. The non-obstructive type of uterus didelphys is usually asymptomatic and it should be suspected if a longitudinal vaginal septum or two cervical canals are discovered. Hysterosalpingography reveals two separate endocervical canals. This opens into two separate non-communicating endometrial cavities. Each endometrial cavity ends with a solitary fallopian tube. Surgery in the form of metroplasty is rarely performed. On the other hand, the obstructed form of didelphys, for example ovira, may present with dysmenorrhea, lower abdominal pain, vaginal discharge, and paravaginal mass. The treatment of a choice for ovira syndrome is resection of the vaginal septum in order to relieve the obstructed hemivagina. Bicornuate uterus account for about 10% of Mullerian duct anomalies. The condition usually remains undiagnosed until a caesarean section or other procedures for evaluation of uterine cavity reveal its existence. Hysterosalpingography will reveal two uterine cavities. However, it could be bicornuate or aseptate uterus. 3D or MRI are required to differentiate between the two conditions. Surgery in the form of metroplasty is rarely performed. It is best reserved for women with recurrent pregnancy loss and no other identifiable cause. Strassman in 1952 described a surgical technique that unified equal-sized endometrial cavities, making an incision in the intervening uterine wall, reapproximating the posterior uterine wall, followed by reapproximation of the anterior uterine wall. This operation has two main disadvantages. This includes post-operative pelvic adhesions, and it also requires caesarean section in subsequent pregnancy to prevent uterine rupture. Uterine septum is the most common congenital uterine anomaly, and it accounts for about 55% of all Mullerian duct anomalies. 
Fertility doesn't appear to be substantially compromised. However, this anomaly is associated with the poorest reproductive outcome of all Mullerian duct anomalies. Hysterosalpingography and the 2D ultrasound are not helpful in differentiation between septate and bicornate uterus. 3D ultrasound and MRI add more information and are helpful in differentiation between the two conditions. Regarding treatment, hysteroscopic septum resection can improve life birth rates and clinical pregnancy rates in women with recurrent pregnancy loss and infertility.